Hi there. I'm Vicki Steves of NYU's Division of Libraries. You're a subject specialist for data science and you are a librarian for research data management and reproducibility. I'm here uh, right now in this video to give you an overview of Kaggle. Kaggle is a really popular uh, website in the data science community. It's owned and operated by Google and it sort of functions as like half a collaboration and learning space but also half of a competition space. You think of Kaggle, a lot of people think of competition, um, but there's a lot more than that actually. So I'm gonna walk you through sort of the basics of how to use Kaggle, the basics of what you might uh, expect to find when you are navigating Kaggle, and then how to get started and how to work within Kaggle. So after you log into Kaggle, which I've already done, uh, you get this nice news feed and so this is just like, I don't follow anyone on Kaggle. This is just sort of the public feed. Um, and there's some interesting things like, oh, a visualization of Airbnb with Seaborn. Oof, that's the longitude and latitude. I might've put that on a graph, but it's, ooh, interesting density. There's also like these Netflix TV and shows. I'm definitely gonna look into that one later. I've already, you can see I already looked at it. I know it's there. I'm really interested in exploring that more. Um, and they have things like your first machine learning model. So you just in the public feed alone, just scrolling down, you can see lots of really interesting things. But the part that makes Kaggle really interesting to me are all these great things on the sidebar here. So let's get into the first one, which of course is the competitions. So there are a few different types of competitions. There are featured competitions. So those are the ones you probably have heard about before. They're what they call full scale machine learning challenges, which are uh, generally geared towards industry. So they're something that's to enhance a commercial entity. One of the more famous ones is the Allstate Claim Prediction Challenge, which uses uh, customer shopping history to predict which insurance policy they're likely to purchase. So that's like directly using someone from industry's data to enhance a service or a product. So they will form teams around this and get started. There are also research challenges, which are another really common type of competition. So these are a little bit more experimental. They're meant to answer a research question so, or to uh, help someone answer a research question. Like one of my uh, ones I like to point to is this large scale text classification where there was a research competition to classify Wikipedia documents into one of 300,000 categories. So that's a really interesting, you know, um, concept to me because I love working with Wikipedia and the commons and things that are openly licensed. So I particularly like that example. Research competitions, as opposed to the featured competitions, don't tend to have prizes or points because they are a little bit more experimental. That said, they offer a great opportunity to work on a problem where there's not an easy solution. So you get to hack at something. And that's really fun, I think, in a lot of ways. The featured competitions, you know, they have prize goals. They uh, have prizes and money. Um, anybody can join them, whether you're an expert or a novice. Um, and so that's typically, I think, what attracts people is uh, the prizes and, and some of the notoriety. While the research, you get notoriety for a different reason, for solving a a messy problem or a problem that doesn't have a clear solution. So there are also getting started competitions on Kaggle, which are the most approachable competitions. You might look for these if you are just getting started with learning the basics of data science. So this is everything from like recognizing handwritten digits to, um, you know, looking at maybe clean data sets like housing prizes and doing some uh, machine learning to answer a question based on those. They don't have prizes or points. Um, they're really long running as well. The others tend to have like a bounded time or a due date, but the getting started challenges are really just that. They're meant to get you started. They're meant to ease you into working in Kaggle, working in a competition. Um, once a getting started challenge, once a submission is two months old in a uh, getting started challenge then it will no longer count towards the leaderboard to give new people an opportunity so if you see that happen that's actually um, a feature not a bug the last type of competition you might see is called a playground competition so these are literally just for fun so the getting started has a purpose 
the research has a purpose, the featured has a purpose, the playground is just here's some interesting thing or here's like a funny thing, do something cool with it. So like how can you classify leaves by seeing images of them uh, and what trees they came from? Can you detect, you know, a pug from a bagel? Like interesting, fun things like that. So they these can have prizes actually. They can range from like kudos to, to money prizes, very small typically. So the playground ones are also just fun if you're interested in like kind of just doing something silly but keeping your skills sharp. So there are some other competitions that you may or may not see called like recruitment competitions. So uh, again, these are like corporate sponsored challenges meant to like boost a resume uh, to be considered by the host of the competition. Um, so the prize is typically a job interview. <laughs> so you can look for those as you are getting ready to find work in, in industry if that's a job path that, that appeals to you. There are other uh, industries that will hire data scientists as well as just like the corporate sector. But um, on Kaggle, typically the recruitment challenges are, are with, you know, corporations. They also have annual challenges. So, um, you know, there's like the March Machine Learning Challenge, which has been uh, run during the US uh, college basketball tournaments every year since 2014. Um, there are many others as well that you can join for every type of annual event. Kaggle also very rarely hosts uh, competitions with limited participation. So these are private or invite only. You might see this as like the Kaggle Masters, uh, which is like by invite only. The submissions to the competition are by invite only and they're um, very rare. So you will, you will see those, but yeah, again, rarely. <clears throat> now that you understand like what competitions may exist on Kaggle. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit about how they are structured. So there's the classic or simple competition, which follows sort of the standard Kaggle format. So there's a data set uh, at the beginning of the competition that everyone has access to uh, who's competing. You will uh, either download the data or run it in a Jupyter notebook through Kaggle in their notebook tab, which I'm gonna show you. And uh, this is the most common by far. So you have some data, you have a question, you let people go hog wild. There are also though these things called two-stage competitions. So the challenge is split in two parts, like a step one and a step two, where the second stage builds on what happened in stage one. So typically uh, stage two involves like maybe some testing or um, using a, uh, augmenting a data set. There are also strictly code competitions. So these are all uh, submitted through Kaggle notebooks. It's not possible to upload submissions directly. Um, this is interesting because, you know, all the users have this access to the same stuff. You're all doing the work in Kaggle notebooks. So there's no like, I get to use a million extra GPUs and win the challenge. You're all sort of in the same environment. And then uh, the winning models tend to be a lot more simple than the ones that might win in other competitions because they have these you know, constraints imposed on them by the platform. So that's actually a win because honestly, I think if you can, I think about it like if you explain a concept simply, a lot of people will get it. If you write a simple model, a lot more people will get it, a lot more people can build on it. So I really uh, like that feature of code competitions. So if we want to view all the competitions that Kaggle has to offer, it's just kaggle.com slash competitions. You can see that there's, uh, they can see that I have not done a lot of competitions and they're like, maybe you wanna do this getting started one first, which is very nice of them. So these, uh, this page contains the active, complete and what's called in-class competitions. So I'm not gonna worry too much about in-class. I'm just gonna show you how to navigate the active competitions. There are lots of different categories. So remember those ones I talked about, research, featured, the recruitment, the getting started, masters, again, invite only, playground just for fun. Then they also have this analytics. Uh, you can see there's not a lot, but it's helping folks, uh, helping these corporations evaluate some of their analytics and helping them with that. You can sort by the newest, the biggest reward, the number of teams. So if we sort by the newest, you can say like, oh, audio detection, that's pretty cool. Um, the NFL has some impact detection. That's pretty neat. It's a code competition. Oh, cool. So you have to do it in, uh, you have to do it in Kaggle's interface. And like, oh, there's rocks, paper, scissors. Like, that's just funny. So this is a nice way to look and navigate Kaggle to find different competitions that you might want to participate in as a team. You can also sort by not only the type. So if you want to narrow it down by research, you can see there's a lot fewer. 
Um, they still have some prize money though, as you can see. The featured also quite a few. Recruitment none right now, which is shocking to me. You can see a lot more of those getting started. So your prize in that case is knowledge, which I think is a huge prize. Um, but if we go back to all categories, you see we have quite a few more available. You can sort by teams. So some of these uh, have quite a lot of teams. This one has almost 5,000, um, that is a lot. Uh, so you can see like, maybe I scroll to the bottom and say like, oh, there's two months to go. Oh, this NFL one only has five teams with two months to go. Maybe I'll give that a shot. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can sort and decide on how to uh, join a Kaggle competition. I also really like just going by the newest too, like this rainforest one, if I had the time, I'd definitely do that one. That looks cool. So everyone in Kaggle competitions uh, does so as a team. So a team is one or more people. So you can have a team by yourself, but that's not as fun. And Kaggle will still call you a team. So you might as well uh, add some people to and get some collaborators. It's important to note too, that Kaggle doesn't have a, a limit on like team size. Uh, but whether you're a team of like one or a team of five, you still will have to do the same task. You'll still have the same deadline. You'll still have the same data, same everything. So you can uh, pick and choose and curate your team to help the challenge or try it by yourself too, if you're confident and feel like you want to try it. There are two types of statuses on teams. So one person will serve as the team leader. So if the people running the competition have to get in touch with the teams, they'll need a point of contact. And that's who the team leader is. They'll also have like some team member modification privileges. So if someone is leaving the team, the team member can remove them, add others, or make someone else the team leader if they have to leave at any point. You will have a team name. You can modify that at any time. You can invite another team to your team if you want to merge them. Once you have your team together, you can then make a submission in order to receive a score and a leadership uh, leaderboard position in a competition. How you do that will depend on the format of the competition, but either way, any in any competition, your team is limited to a certain number of submissions per day. The average is five, but it will vary. So make sure your submission is camera ready. That's always uh, what I like to tell folks. Uh, now that you know a little bit about how competitions are formed, how to form teams, um, I would give some tips for those teams who uh, want to really make the most of their Kaggle competition or their Kaggle work in general. Um, so let's see some other uh, facets of Kaggle that can help us with our data science work. So you can see here after the competition is data. So let's take a look at data. Kaggle supports uh, the hosting of public data sets. These are accessible through lots of different ways, like through their API, through the notebooks, which we'll take a look at next, um, through just direct download. Um, and they are, they as a platform, strongly encourage people who publish data sets to do so in like a non-proprietary format, which as a research data management librarian, I love because this is also the advice that I give people. If you want to maximize the sustainability and usability of your data, it should be in things like CSV, JSON, plain text, open, non-proprietary formats. So this is the approach Kaggle has taken because they are really interested in supporting usability, which is huge for data science. We need our data in a plain format that we can quickly import into the language of our choosing and get working on. So Kaggle supports CSVs, JSON, SQLite, and archives, which are like compressed files like uh, zip, tar, etc. Kaggle also supports BigQuery data sets, which is like a big data SQL store. It's invented by Google. So of course, Kaggle's run by Google. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, they do allow other file formats, but they are not as well supported. So I really recommend you stick to those that I've just listed, those nice plain text formats. So obviously a big one right now, our election data, the COVID-19 data from Johns Hopkins, you can see when it was updated 10 hours. You can see that it's two megabytes. There's 10 CSV files. Uh, and this data set is got a 9.7, it's well documented. The files are in a machine ready format, readable format. And there are code examples available with these notebooks that we'll see in a bit. 
So Kaggle also assigns these sort of scores and assigns these interesting, like here, this one is missing a license. So that's a big bummer. We don't know how to use it then. If you see a data set without a license, you unfortunately have to assume that all rights are reserved. And that unfortunately means that you can really view the data, but you can't like make public changes to it or anything that we would want to do in data science work. There are lots of filters you can use. I love to filter on licenses first because I, of course, want to make sure that I'm allowed to use the data in the way that I want to use it. So I will typically filter on Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a suite of licenses. They go from very open to uh, less open. Um, so with Creative Commons, you can have things like put it in the public domain. Anyone can use it however they want. You can also have restrictions like this data, you can use it, you must attribute me, and you can't sell it. That's what they call the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial License. So there's a suite of these. Um, and nicely, Kaggle links us when we see a license so we can better understand it. So let's uh, go into this COVID-19 data from Johns Hopkins, because Kaggle says that it is well-formed, and I'm interested in testing that. And so let's see here. There's a nice description of the data set. They point you back to the GitHub repository uh, where the data set is primarily hosted. So they, that points to me that they might have some connection between Kaggle and GitHub, which we'll see in the next video. They have a discussion forum here that Kaggle uh, has in their platform. Uh, you can see the creator has put some, but also a user. They have a set of public notebooks that people can uh, fork and rerun. Like these are other people's notebooks that are using this data. Here's the uh, author of the data again, or the person who's bringing it into Kaggle, I should say. In this metadata tab, you can see all the license information. So, all right, here they're using Creative Commons attribution. And when I click that, it will go and tell me exactly what I can do. So I can redistribute this however I want. I can remix it however I want, but I have to give them credit, which of course I would want to do anyway. So make sure you cite them. Make sure you say, I got this data set from Kaggle. You want to do your due diligence in giving attribution uh, to the folks who are uh, enabling your work. Kaggle also, when you click into a data set, it's nice because they show you uh, some basic like distributions up top. Like that's really interesting. Um, Andorra has very few cases, which makes sense to me. You can see the different data sets on the side. I assume convenient means processed and not convenient. And raw is unprocessed. So if we click into that, we'll probably see a very, very different data set. Yeah, so there's lots of nulls, there's lots of blanks. So clearly someone's transformed this for us and we can download it here. We can export it to Google Sheets. We can look at a compact view or what's nice, we can get a look at all of the columns and, and get a quick view of what they all look like. And we can do that for any of these as well. So if I clicked into just a random one above for global, you can see here, since they processed the data, there are a lot less nulls and missing, and it looks good here. You can see they're showing us 10 out of 270 columns. So whew. so that is like rough strokes, how you use uh, and find data in Kaggle. The really cool thing for me is uh, not only just discovering it like from my newsfeed or going from the data tab, but also that there are um, nice connections to notebooks. So you can see here this tab called notebooks and it's what it sounds like. It's public Jupyter notebooks hosted on Kaggle. So you can uh, look by the most votes, which I assume is like people upvoting Kaggle. So you can see a lot of people really like this comprehensive data exploration with Python, the Titanic data science uh, solutions. So I assume that's using like the Titanic data set. Um, you can look at recently created, recently run, or of course sort by relevance. That only really works if you're putting in a search. So like if I put library and I search by relevance, yeah, there's a lot of Python libraries. I know no one is going to, oh, mastering the San Francisco library data. That's nice. So if I click into this particular notebook, you can see there's three versions of it, version three of three. Uh, they want to look at library activity. That's really interesting. Maybe I'll use this for our own library data at NYU. Uh, it reads in the data set. 
And look at this average registration through the years. That's really interesting. The cool thing here is I can copy and edit this. So if I click this, it will create a copy of this person's Jupyter notebook under my account. So I can do whatever I want with it. I can change things, I can add to it. So this is one way that Kaggle helps us build on other people's work and can help us learn new processes. Like I'm not entirely sure exactly how to use Seaborn yet. I usually stick to Matplotlib. So I'm interested in checking out Seaborn. So that's really fun for me. So yeah, this is really nice. I can share a new version. I can share it with a team. I can restart my session. Like this is all mirrored from your local Jupyter Notebook. It's just sort of re-themed to fit Kaggle. So you can see things like here's a new notebook. Uh, you can load a different notebook from a URL, like a GitHub URL, for instance. You can move cells up. You can toggle the outputs, you can restart and run all, you can get different add-ons. Um, so you can see there's lots of things here that you are um, similar to our Jupyter Nova interface on our computer. We can use metrics, we can, if we need a GPU, we can click it or a TPU. So those are all things available to us within the notebook interface. And again, I like clicking this tab because I just am interested in seeing the public notebooks and how people are doing their data science work. So I will say for both notebooks and data, you can upload your own. So you probably noticed in the data tab, there was a big plus button that said upload data. And in the notebooks, you noticed a big plus button that says new notebooks. So we can of course always add our own in addition to what's available on Kaggle. And this will be really important as we're you know, doing the data-thon. Of course, you can publish data as public or private. Um, so there are some bare minimum fields that go along with uploading, like you must put a title, you only have a few different places you can upload data from, those include your local machines, public URLs, like a GitHub repository, and from the output of a notebook. So if you have a, if you have a notebook running in Kaggle that produces some data, you can save it right to Kaggle. Um, so that's pretty interesting as well. And you can do that again for notebooks as well as uh, data. So I will say too that you noticed there's uh, Jupyter. They also have support for R Markdown if folks are using R. Um, so this is uh, an, another sort of like executable notebook for the R community. To get started with that, when you create a notebook in that scripts window, you can switch the language and you can switch it to R Markdown. Um, so it's a few clicks to get to a different language. But typically when you are uh, running the default, it will default to Python. So there are lots of different uh, notebook options. Like if you have a specific Docker container you wanna use with a notebook, you can provide that. You can install new R and uh, Python packages as you're working in your notebook. So you can sort of treat it like a little bit of a throttled uh, version of your local system. And I say throttled because like they um, give you a subset of their computing resources. Obviously they can't let you run wild on their compute. Uh, otherwise they'll run out of money quick. So uh, you, they have access to a free GPU and free TPU for you. And if you go beyond that, then of course Kaggle's run by Google. So you can connect to Google's cloud services. You can provision stuff with Kubernetes. You can do any other sort of scaling up as you need to. So you can always get started here and then, yeah, scale up. So officially, uh, as of today, as of uh, the time I'm recording this, so the third week of November, um, TPU, if you use a TPU, you have a three hour time limit. Otherwise you get nine hours of execution time for each notebook. You get 20 gigs of uh, saved disk space. You get an additional scratch pad. There are also um, some CPU specifications you can, you can set either four CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM or two CPUs and 13 gigs of RAM. So there are some other options uh, for you as well in uh, configuring your notebook. So in addition, you uh, a few more tabs I wanted to show you. This one is the discuss tab. So this is what it sounds like. It's about getting some questions and answers. It's about help for specific data, for specific uh, Jupyter notebooks, or just in general, like how are we doing updates in this particular competition? Um, you can look through different ones. Like if I want to look at just the general forums and not include anything specific to a competition, I can do that by selecting forums here. 
or if I want things specific to data sets, I can search by the ones with the most votes. Or for me, I'd probably look at the most recent comments because that's what I'm interested in. Like here is an interesting question about the license. So this person wants to use this data, but is not aware of what the license is. So this is also a nice use of the uh, discussing feature. Kaggle also has courses. So if you are interested in augmenting your um, current data science work, you can look at these different courses that you can take. So for instance, if I clicked intro to SQL, there's a tutorial and an exercise, you can keep going. They give you a pathway. So when you're done with this, maybe then uh, you look at advanced SQL. And when I click on advanced SQL, that's the end. So that's great. But now I know beginner and advanced SQL and I can always go back to my courses and keep going. They also, of course, have like job listings at Kaggle that you can look through too. So this is a little bit outside of the purview of the datathon, but I just like to mention it for students, especially so that if you're looking for a job, look at Kaggle, you can search by experience. So if I said like, I don't know, three years, there's a fair amount of like a healthcare risk advisory. Um, yeah, there's quite a few. So you can for sure uh, subscribe to these and, and look through them at your leisure too. Uh, the tags are useful. So if you wanna look at a specific tag for um, you know questions, competitions or data sets that fit them like, oh, here's an interesting history tab. Oh, look at this. It's, it's about recognizing uh, uh, ancient Japanese characters. So that's really interesting to me. And, definitely something I would want to look at. You can see they have lots of notebooks, lots of discussion. So this is uh, one of those tags, again, on the sidebar there. That's pretty interesting. You can see there's a lot more e even beyond those big um, ones on the left bar there. Last but not least is the documentation. So documentation is really important for everything we do, but especially for like the websites we have to use to do our work. So you can look at all of the documentation for all these things I was just talking about if you want more of an in-depth look as to how Kaggle works. Um, they also provide some nice guidance on like how to invite collaborators. Um, and they give you some examples too along with these, which I also really like. And of course, they have some getting started on Kaggle videos that they point to as well here, like this playlist from Kaggle themselves about getting started with Kaggle. So you can definitely supplement this video with this playlist, I would say. And again, that all comes from their documentation. So I hope that I hope that helped point you to the big headings on the Kaggle website that are going to be most important for you and some uh, best practices within to find things like code data to work together. I would say in general on Kaggle, what I found works best for data science teams to do things like when you're competing or when you're even practicing on uh, old Kaggle problems, you should only ever work on one problem at a time, only ever work on one competition at a time. Otherwise you stretch yourself very, very thin. I would also say, I usually don't tell people to win or to aim to win actually, just aim for the top. Um, Kaggle competitions are very popular and I think aiming for the top is a better approach. Um, for yourself for goal setting as well. It's a little bit more of an attainable goal right off the bat. Um, I have not won a Kaggle competition. I don't know many people who have, but I know people who've gotten in the top and that's a huge accomplishment in and of itself. So if you don't win, don't feel bad, um, aim for the top. I would also say those discussion forums that we saw within a data set and then generally within Kaggle are really important and you should do your sharing on those discussion forums too. You can find a lot of give and take there from past students uh, who I'm sure would be more than happy to help you. Then lastly, I would encourage folks to uh, maybe minimize the time reading about or thinking about a good idea for a competition or for a problem and implementing it. So these are typically very fast as datathon is gonna happen very quickly. So you want to uh, really get your good idea set at the beginning, think about things, but don't spend too much time between thinking about it, iterating on it, discussing, discussing, reading, and actually getting to implementing it. Cause that will take a lot longer maybe than uh, you might think. So I'm back in my Kaggle homepage. And now what I want to do is get an API key. I pulled up the documentation of course, which tells me the best way to use Kaggle's API. And of course, the easiest way is the command line tool implemented in Python. So this will be great for us because then we can put it at like the top of our notebooks. We can configure 
our, um, you know, notebooks that we're hosting in GitHub to talk to Kaggle. So I just wanted to show you how to get your API key and how to point to Kaggle with it real quick, because we will be using the API key for our, the next video. So when we go to our account on Kaggle, I want to use Kaggle's API. There's a button that says create new API token. It's going to generate this JSON, uh, this Kaggle.json. I'm going to save that. I'm not going to show it on this video because I don't want all of you to steal it, although I could just expire it. Kaggle's telling me nicely where to put it and also pointing me also very nicely to these document to this documentation. So, okay, now that we have our Kaggle API key and an understanding of Kaggle and some of the best practices, let's get started with collaborating on GitHub and connecting our GitHub to our Kaggle.